Well, just a, just a general overview of who we are. I mean, I'm Professor Kelly Phelps. I, I uh, come from the Xavier University where I'm the head of the sculpture program. Uh, I've been there roughly 17, 18 years. Um, and Professor Kyle Phelps, University of Dayton, and I run the sculpture program in almost 19 years. 19 years. Yeah. So Kyle and I grew up in a little small farming factory town um, in East Central Indiana called um, Newcastle. And it was kind of like living in a coal miners camp in many ways or company town where the factory was the primary source of industry. So the picture of the mine would be like, like living in a, uh, like a coal miners camp where the factory controlled kind of all aspects of the city. Um, and what I mean by that is like the factory literally had like factory housing and factory stores and the high school was named after the factory. Yeah, the, the barber shop, you know, cut every like all the factory workers' hair, and it was a really close knit kind of a community, very much like a miners' camp. I mean, um, it was a Chrysler town, so your dad, your mom or dad, drove a Chrysler product, and it was one of those um, kind of the the old school American kind of pride type of town where whatever the factory produced, you support it, you you bought it, so. And there were lots of these little towns that kind of were sprinkled around. Um, Anderson, Indiana, or let's see, what was the other one? Connorsville. All these little towns had very unique fa like factories. So like if you, your father worked in Connorsville at the Ford plant, you drove a Ford product. If your mom or dad worked at Westinghouse, you guys had a Westinghouse um, refrigerator or freezer. So it was one of those types of things where it was American made and and people were very proud of that. And they all lived kind of like sustainable lives. I think the whole community kind of bought in to the fact and notion that the factory would provide for the families. So it was all kind of um, based on pride and community. And and like I said, everyone kind of bought into that whole idea that the, product, the factory will provide for the families. So the work that you're seeing right now it's kind of, um, it's our way of paying homage to, to that whole sense of uh, community and that whole lifestyle. And many ways that you're looking at right now, the work that you see on the wall, especially the working class imagery are, are kind of like shrines or altars to those people. So in many ways, if you're looking at like little historical niches that existed in, in our, not just our town, but all, all the little Rust Belt towns that populated kind of the Rust Belt areas that we, um, that we research. So we really look at these altars or shrines as kind of the, the after effects. Once industry fell apart, these factories were left and, as kind of like visual scabs in many ways of what used to be. So it's funny because Kyle and I had took it took Kyle and I a long time to get to this point. What are we? Why are we making these these altars or these shrines? And and we come to realize that our father and our mother and the people in our communities worked in these plants religiously. It was almost like their religion. Um, so it, the the actual the the actual structures of these factories took on these these kind of uh, personifications of what the church structure actually is. So, so we like to look at it as not only just the practice, but also the artifact. Um, so it's important for Kyle and I to, also, to actually archive and, and find these found objects that, that kind of um, talked about these factories, but also think about what it is to be a member of these communities and what it is to work in, in, a, in a community where the factory literally was everything. So what I mean by that is once the factory left, the, the, literally the town started to crumble. So everything started to come back in a negative way and, and more of a, things like alcoholism and, and 
drug use, drug use, domestic violence and poverty and everything that really wasn't really present on the surface uh, when the factories were were in its boom really is present now. So and the factors that we grew up in, like especially in our hometown, are they're they're not different from Youngstown and Flint, Michigan and Detroit, Michigan and you know, all these Rust Belt places. So it's not about where we come from, but it's 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 more of a kind of a our work transcends different different areas. So you'll look behind you and you'll notice um, a lot of scorched metal metal work. All of those are coming from down factories. Uh, Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Youngstown, Newcastle. We would go around and we'd actually scavenge and 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 kind of archive different pieces of materials that are taken off of different factories. So it's more important for Kelly and I to know, hey, that come from a Buick plant, or hey, that come from old Chrysler, um, than to just go and get new metal and try to make it have that old feel, that old history. So you'll see a lot of that same motif, that same use of materials, scorched metal, gears, um, broken glass, anything that we can find and rework back into our work to give that sense of place and time. Yeah. It's funny because um, when Kyle and I were, were younger, we were small kids and we were forced to go to church, we would sit there and first of all, we'd be bored to tears because you know we weren't really interested in the scripture or anything like that the preacher was talking about. But our first real introduction to art was the art that existed on the walls of the church. Because keep in mind, we grew up in a little factory town. Art was on no one's radar whatsoever. I mean, we had that holiday art you know, Thanksgiving, you put your hand on that construction paper and you made that weird, ridiculous turkey. That was our interpretation of what art was. But it wasn't until we actually got inside the church and we actually start to see art. I mean, narratives, stories. Um, stained glass. Stained glass. And, friezes. And, and, and architectural friezes and, and all kinds of relief work and the Stations of the Cross. So that really kind of made us think about how art our religious um, experience is kind of, I would say, unconsciously kind of seeped into our work. And to see our dad and our mom and the people in our community and our neighborhoods, how they went to work every day religiously because they believed in the factory. And they even believed in the factory, you know, the products that came from these factories. So it became our, became our religion and our kind of our, our aesthetic that we that we inject into our work. So before we actually started to deal with found objects, we would make figurative work that had no context, meaning there was no found objects to connect them to. So they were almost um, kind of artificial. They're like humble figurines. They didn't have that same kind of feeling until we actually combined them with found objects from particular sites. So you'll start to see there's always going to be a figure element to a majority of all of the work that you see on the wall. Kelly and I, we started off as painters. We didn't drop what we learned from painting. We just do it in a, in a different fashion. I think we were so enamored into making frames. That's what got us on the wall instead of just doing traditional sculptural work that's 360 in the round. So now we can compete with painting, printmaking, photography, you know, any 2D work. And this is something really good for, for you guys, the next generation of young artists to come out is to not look at art or approach art in a singular way. Um, I'm a painter, I'm a printmaker, or I'm a ceramist or a sculptor. When you look at things in, as in like little silos, then you don't fully get to utilize the greater toolbox that art kind of presents itself. So as Kyle and I said, you know, we don't consider ourselves just sculptors or ceramists. We consider ourselves visual artists who happens to, you know, enjoy ceramics and sculpture and photography and painting. Painting. So if you were able to take all your art skills and then just focus on making art instead of just giving yourself a title or putting yourself in a small category, your art will actually propel itself into more than one direction. So I think the biggest takeaway from the show outside of just the aesthetic side of it is to understand that you guys are taking lots of different art courses. 
figure out a way to take all those art courses, including your art history, and produce art utilizing all those skill sets. Does everybody have questions? Yeah, so thank you for the shout out to art history. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could just talk about a couple of the pieces that are in the show, just in um, tell the story of the piece, um, how you made the choices you made, any kind of layers of symbolism that might be involved in it so that we can have your voice alongside the work. We'll talk about one of them, like the, the flag pieces. And just to let you know, we've been, Kelly and I, we've been doing the, the flag work long before Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's just so happened because of all the notoriety and then the TV and the news that that's what you see, but we've been doing this for, for, for decades. So, so. I, th I think with the flag work, primarily the flag work right now, it gave Kyle and I a chance to appreciate like the civil rights era without actually having complete ownership over it because Kyle and I, we were on the tail end of that civil rights era. I mean, we're 48 today. So if you do the math, I mean, we were really at the very end of the whole civil rights era. So this became our own. We have a sense of ownership with what's going on because this is ha things that are happening within our generation. Our own lived experiences. So whether it be police uh, brutality or um, urban violence or poverty, all of those things are happening right now. And Kyle and I could really grasp it because it has happened to us personally. So yes, we respect uh, the images from the civil rights era and, 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 you know, we pay a lot of respect to that, but there's no sense of real sense of ownership with that. Not like it is right now today with the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I mean, there's so many things happening right now and it's in real time. In many ways, Kyle and I feel like we're almost like um, journalists, like a journalist, except we have to make everything. So um we have no bones about using symbolism like, like the flag some people automatically oh we're you know we're, we're not being you know we're, we're patriotic patriotic enough. or disrespecting the flag and we use symbols to 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 get people's attention you know we live in this great society this great united states of america but we have problems so and that's something to the things that we want to bring to the forefront um, problems with police brutality, problems of how we treat our veterans. So the piece in the very back that you're looking at called the Patriot, you know, that is a direct link of how we use the flag and how we use the, the figure narrative to, to, to bring those, those social issues to the forefront. All too often, we don't, we don't even look at people and, and notice that, you know, the toils or, or the hardship that they're living. We just look right through them. You know, we did a series called the Invisible People series and, and that dealt with a lot of um, uh, bigger narratives um, dealing with like, oh, what, homelessness, janitors, people we wouldn't, wouldn't think twice about. And we want to bring those people to the forefront as well. I mean, even with the, the factory workers that you guys see around um, with the work right now, those factory workers were so used to seeing because we're a consumer driven society, the end products, but we never really focus on those people who produce those objects, whether it be a car or a microwave or LCD TV, whatever it is that we're producing. And oftentimes those very people who are producing those things don't necessarily or may not necessarily be able to even afford to purchase those objects. So those those uh, those people become those invisible people and it's important for us to really look at those people as kind of like the like the working class heroes that they are uh, even in this day and age of COVID, covid and and you know the coronavirus we look at those uh people who are on the front lines uh those grocery store clerks who are restocking shelves and the the nurses who are on the front lines um, those people have been underrepresented since day one. No one really gave a care about nurses or, or the person restocking your shelf at Kroger. Or, but now, now they are because of a, a crisis. So, I mean, that's the main reason why Kyle and I really look at these people as, wow, they are and have always been working class heroes. Mm -hmm. 
so in many ways, like the issues with the flag and like after 9-11, everybody was super patriotic again. And, and then, you know, 10 years later, then we're right back where we started from as far as like, we still have poverty, we still have all the other isms that, that contribute to our society. That's what really motivates Kyle and I to do what we do. I think it, it come with a lot of kind of evolution for our own work. For, for probably, oh my gosh, I can just say many, many years, we omitted the woman out of our work. The whole body of work was all male driven. And then we had to take a step back and really think, wow, our sister worked in the factory, our mom worked in the factories. So to put all these isms together, we, we slowly kind of kind of opened ourselves up to including, you know, work about classism, work about, about racism, work about sexism, so it's not just about us, it's about how we see the world. One good story is like, um, when Kyle and I went to, let's see, wow, this is a long time ago. When Kyle and I first got accepted to graduate school, Kyle and I were coming home for, I think it was for fall break. And this is like in the early, well, 90s. late late 1990s. It was 1997. Mm -hmm. 96. 96 or 97. We're coming back home for fall break. We were at University of Kentucky and we get all the way to our house. And then the police pull us over in front of our home. And thank God our father was outside. He was outside mowing the lawn and mowing, mulching the leaves because it was fall. And it was so humiliating and scary to be racially profiled and to be, to be yeah, the cops followed. Literally followed us all the way to our house. I didn't think, well, the cops didn't even know that we lived there. It was so shocking and so upsetting. You know, that's the stuff that, that it's burned into our memories. But that was back when we were in grad school. But we frequently have been pulled over. We had been kind of racially profiled, shopping. And here we are, we're, we're professionals within our field, you know, and, and we're still treated like it, this stuff really happens. It's, it's a real thing. So, like I said, those are some real experiences that we, you know, I don't have to go back and reflect on civil rights movement. This is happening right now within, you know, our lifetime. And to experience something like it's so humiliating and so, yeah, it's demoralizing. So it's just, it's just terrible things that we have an obligation to kind of, kind of pass those things out. Um, to see violence firsthand, you know, domestic violence or or gang violence, you know, it's not just what you see in the news. These are personal experiences that that happen in our family, you know. So there's a, a lot of narratives that are, are are kind of built into our into our memories that we don't have to open up the the newspaper or turn on the TV, you know. These are lived experiences that that we had gone through, or I mean to to have the talk. So as young African Americans. Um, especially African-American male, to have that sit down discussion before you go out at night. This is the conduct. This is the way that you should interact with the police. I mean, these are all real, all real things that people of color have had to deal with. And, and pass they, down to their family. And pass down, I mean, to have that discussion, how to, how to interact with police. I mean, most people just don't even think twice about having a discussion with your, your son or child because of that. So our, our work also kind of touches on things like um, the, the difference between black society and white society, um, entitlements and, and certain privileges. I know privilege is another hot term that's thrown around, but I mean, all of these things are very real. Um, things that you worry about or things that I worry about, you would never have to worry about. Period. Just end of discussion. So Kyle and I are really exploring all of these kind of um, isms and everything from privilege to modern day race issues. Um, these are very real things. And it's funny because um, our father, before he passed, was always interested in doing something outside of um, factory life as far as subject matter. So he appreciated what we did as far as that, the, the factory work and the issues with race, but it was always looking for other things for us to get into, other subjects. Like one day he called us up on the phone and he said, hey, you know, um, 
you should really do a sculpture about Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan. I'm like, yeah, Dad. <laughs> we'll, we'll get right on that. We're going to get on that soon. Or, you know, he used to watch Nova and, and wanted to do, um, I saw this cool Indian riding a horse. Like, I don't know what the hell that has to do with anything we do. <laughs> but he was always supportive, but yet interested in us uh, not going into that kind of that painful route of looking at things. I think mainly because dad lived through a lot of that kind of stuff and it was he was just too close to it. I mean, <clears throat> from you know, going from factory to factory, if one factory falls down, then he'll get employed at another factory. But it's always been that whole work ethic and that route to provide your family that he didn't want to see his sons just to keep portraying that over and over and over again. But here again, you know, Kelly and I, to this day, we don't see a whole lot of work about, you know, the guy that pumps your gas, the guy that delivers your mail, you know, um, the woman who makes up your bed when you go on, on you know, vacations and stuff. You don't, you don't see stuff like that. And, you know, these people have value. These people are our heroes. I wanted to ask you about one of the students who was in here uh, in, the, in the gallery yesterday made the observation that the three pieces with the flags, um, the social justice pieces, show uh, multiple generations. And I wonder if you could talk, you know, so the David and Goliath is really just a young boy you know, who shouldn't be finding himself in that situation. And, um, and then the uh, injustice or just us is a, a slightly older, older male. And then there's um, older males than in the, in the other piece. And I just wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what another, another comment that was made or observation was just um, the decision to show emotion and the way in which you did that. For David and Goliath, the piece is already very powerful from a distance. And as you get up closer, you see the tears streaming down the boy's face. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's a really important aesthetic or that's an important decision as an artist to show him sobbing or to show him weeping in the, in the moment of confrontation when, yeah. It was one of those pieces where we thought about the current climate, what was going on, um, well, that still continues to go on, uh, the over-militarization of, of police forces. When I look at that piece and I look about look at other societies and other cultures, like what has happened with um, the conflicts between like the Palestinians versus the Israelis and the, 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 the Palestinian young youth, you know, hurling a rock against a tank. So when I look at David Goliath, I see it in the same way. The, the sheer use of force that, that, that occurs when you have a, a, an altercation between African-American, whether it be youth or just you know adult African-Americans, compared to the sheer use of force that the police will come at you with. A good example, my wife and I were driving and, and I had gotten pulled over. Um, but it was weird because as soon as the first cop pulled me over and, and took my ID, four more police cars pulled up and it was a traffic stop. It was like, I was speeding. So it was like, wow, is that really necessary for that many police to show up or for police in full riot gear and, and militarized weapons and vehicles for, for an altercation that could be de-escalated in other ways. So when I look at the violence and I, and I look at what's happening with, with police brutality, I look, I'm looking at it in that, and kind of in that lens. But also I think that there comes a point of time where people are just tired, right? They're tired of what they see, the things that they experience at any age, young, from youth to seniors. It's something that over time, that anger, that, that rage, that it builds up. And sometimes it's just misdirected. So, you know, this is also a point where Kelly and I, we'd always kind of, we dabble in going backwards and look at religious iconography. like, And that's where we kind of borrow from things in the past. So, so that's where David and Goliath kind of rings through. You know, you have the police in his riot gear, and then you have David holding this rock. 
you know, standing in defiance of the law. So. Yeah, um, thank you. That's, that's really uh, clarifying actually. And it really um, brings a lot more to the pieces. Um, I want to open it up to the students and see if what kind of questions they might have for you. My name is Alex Lewis, and I was interested in hearing about your found objects. Now, I know you went and scavenged many of the objects, and I was hoping you could speak a little bit as the act of scavenging towards the pieces. Was that very important to you, the sites you've seen, the memories that they brought up, or the objects you were looking for? Like the lipstick and the bandana, were the, was that a found object in a locker room somewhere, and you saw that and knew that that should be a piece? But most of the time we would go to dilapidated factories that's been torn down. In these factories, they'd have um, locker rooms. So anything, any remnants, we can go out to CVS or Walgreens and get that lipstick, all right? But it's more important for us to actually go to a place and get that lived experience, that, that object, that thing that was left behind and put back in. So old work boots, metal gears tools anything that we can find again even if it's coming from the factory cafeteria you'll see that texture of canned goods that's reused back into the metal work so you'll see it time and time again that we use because it's important for us to know hey that come from this plant this come from you know a factory or support factory so it's more or less a, it's important for us to know where it's coming from but yeah another thing is that especially for you guys i mean for a lot of young artists, the way artists typically start, well, you get an art project or assignment and immediately think, wow, I gotta go to Home Depot. I have to go to the art store and that's where art originates. You don't have to have to get pimped out by all of these art, you know, I have to get these certain tools because it comes from Utrecht or, you know, a ceramic supply place. You can make tools, you can make objects, you can go find objects. You don't have to be pimped out by an art supplier. Art is everywhere, art is everything. So it's just really up to you to make those decisions. What's gonna be best for your work? If, Dumpster diving is something that we do all the time. If you are interested in artwork that involves or talks about the environment, then you need to go to the environment. You need to go to that source. Um, and you know, two things will happen with that. Number one, you'll find that your work becomes a little bit more authentic. It's true. Um, it has a time, place, and history. So those things are very important. Otherwise, you end up making contrived things that have no sense of history. No context. No yeah. context. Um, and you, you go and you reinforce that whole notion that art has to start from Home Depot or Lowell's or Menards. <laughs> or I hate that because all of our students think, well, oh, I got to start my project. I got to go and order you know, $10,000 worth of supplies from the art store. I hate that. Yeah. So that's that's how we look at our objects. Um, and the fact that there are so many places every day, even we just passed one earlier today, the factory closing down. So I'm looking at that as hey, that's that is our Home Depot. That's our Toys R Us. That's that's where we're going to go and retrieve objects. Sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. You gotta do what you gotta do. Yep. My name is Jack. And um, I'm, a, I'm a fine arts major, concentrating in painting. And I wanted to ask a question, <clears throat> sort of piggybacking off of the found objects and when those come into the work, do, do the found objects come first or does the, does, does the shrine itself come first? And I also wanted to ask about um, the, because you elaborated, so well on the meaning and significance behind these works. If you could touch on the practical aspects of creating and making these works, what comes first and um, maybe why? So I, I think to start with the first question. So the fact that we are factory, we're offspring of factory workers. So that in itself, we took on the responsibility to continue those people's stories. So how we first start out with the project is that we go to the site and we photo document like crazy. So we do in this day and age with digital cameras, everybody's got iPhones and things like that. And we just go and we scope the place out and we just literally take pictures of the site as well as the surrounding community. 
the houses, the people. And then once we get enough of the digital stuff, then we actually go in and go into audio and we actually will go in and we'll start recording interviews. So we go into the union halls or to the surrounding houses or the people who have worked in the plant and we will try to conduct as many interviews as possible. Then we actually go in and we actually will start to archive materials, like whether it be um, going in and grabbing a piece of, a piece of um, material I just found the other day. So, so literally going in and finding objects and archiving those objects, letting us um, know where these, these, these pieces of um, artifacts will come from. And then we, we put it off to the side and we start thinking about our figure. So in many ways, it's, it's not any one practice like we think about the, the, the framework first, excuse me, or we start with the figure last. We always start with, we have to have that initial documentation because what happens a lot of the times that these factories are scraped off of the earth as if they'd never existed. And that, that's the real pain for Kyle and I, because we want to preserve that whole notion of American history, not so much African-American history, but just American history, that these places existed and they provided a sustainable life for, for this particular community. So a lot of these places like the Chrysler plant no longer exist in our town. Um, they have a corner of the building and that is it. So a whole history has been just obliterated, completely wiped away, scraped off the earth as if you could, as if it never existed. That is pretty jive. That's pretty, that's pretty effed up to think about a whole generation, many generations of that just disappear. So Kyle and I um, really like to go to these sites and, and preserve that whole notion of what that plant looked like, or you'll see things in the factories like between the two gentlemen right behind you. Uh, you'll see things like clear store windows. There's always references back to what that particular plant looked like, the smokestacks or, or uh, the factory water tower. Every town has got a water tower. Right? So every factory town has got a huge water tower. And typically those water towers are the last things to fall. So, it's things like that that become really important as far as trying to archive um, little bits and pieces of that history. And then, like I said, we do bring in the traditional handmaking, you know, working with the figure of relief. Um, we always build, clean up, send it off to be fired. After it's fired, then we do our surfacing. So going back, you said that you were a, a painter. We start off as painting, but like I said, we were so enamored with making the stretchers, you know, for canvas and that, that's what actually got us on the wall. We didn't drop what we learned from painting. Now we apply it to a more three-dimensional realm. So it's something that, like I said, we're taking from that bigger toolbox. We're not just dropping what we learn, you know, and moving on to something else. We're combining as much of stuff as you possibly can think of. So that long span, the, the, the diptych that's in the back of the, the photographs. I mean, this is where we're bringing photography back into our work. It all fits within this kind of, um, has continuity. So one thing relates back to the other. So we have no, we take no, we have no qualms about borrowing from photography or borrowing from ceramics and sculpture. If we, if it works, we use it. Yep. Can I just ask a clarifying question? So when you said, so you're archiving these pieces, you're keeping track of where they came from and connecting it to the interviews and connecting it to the photo doc? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then, so then, is the structure and shape of the of yes. the architectures related directly visually to what you saw when you were there? So what you're seeing, if you look at those sculptures in the back of the two fellows back there, yeah. they're actually parts boxes. So what the transmission sets into when it comes off of assembly line, like a tray, like a tray. So you're looking at physical boxes that we would, and then reclad in metal. So each one of those trays held a part of a transfer case. Or a piece, uh, a series of gears or things like that. So when they're coming up the line, you'll see about 80 of these trays come down. They're out of wood. And then you would have assembly line workers literally picking from each one of these trays, assembling gears. So what we learned in the past, our early work was all welded metal steel work. 
So it was like, wow, for one, a lot of galleries were pissed off because then you have an 800 pound sculpture on a drywall wall. And like, wow, oh, we got to lighten the load. We got to lighten this up. So then we figured out how we could actually reclad some of these surfaces so that we were able to make lighter work. And the reality is all of that work really stacks really nicely. So we're thinking in a longer term, like how do we store, how do we transport, how do we ship? So all of those figures pop off of those environments and they have the ability to stack on top of each other, much like you would see in a, in a, in a, in, in a manufacturing plant. All these things are, are compartmentalized and they all seem to kind of stack together. So all of that is kind of that, that factory aesthetic that, were, that really attracted Kyle and I to this. That's great, thank you. Um, anybody else? Okay, so mine's got like a weird little lead up. Um, so you said, one of you said you uh, work at Xavier and one of you said that you work at UV. And I was born in Cincinnati and moved to like Troy Dayton area. So like, I'm like, hey, that's me. Um, I was really curious to see how those towns have kind of shaped your work into the present. Cause I know uh, at least from being from Cincinnati, it is not what it used to be, um, especially. And Dayton, especially, has been going through some tough times in the recent. So I was curious to see how those have affected your work in the present and into the future. Well, what Kyle and I have noticed that, and you know, we speak for manufacturing, but we don't speak for all manufacturing. The plants that we grew up around were called right. primary plants. So that's where the raw castings um, That's where you get the scorched metal. The scorched black metal, and metal, black and metal comes from all that really dirty, gritty. It's where they temper the metal to make it hard. So when we go to places like AK Steel and Middletown and and places like that, it's weird because. Okay, a good example. We went back to Newcastle, Indiana, and we had a silo exhibition, the first silo in 25, 25 years, and it was like, wow, they, we were like working class heroes to the local community. And, you know, they wrote big articles and it was almost like they gave us the key of the city because we were really talking about this, them. So they welcome us with open arms, but at the same time, Kyle and I are really kind of like, we're talking about you. We are talking about the factories who kind of, in many ways, provided for families but betrayed them at the same time because the factories were really, they provided until you were no longer needed. needed. And then they moved on. And they moved on to another town to, to exhaust their natural resources, people. And then they move on to another town. So a good example is like Newcastle, Indiana has, has had Chrysler plants there and Delphi and, and Firestone and, you know, all these plants. And when they become either in trouble, like Firestone, Firestone had a big lawsuit. And at the time they were building brakes and brake assemblies and brake pads out of asbestos. So a whole town has been exposed to asbestos. So when they had the class action lawsuit, they upped and moved the factory to another town. So even though they provided, they use people in the, until they were just totally expendable and then they move on somewhere else. So or just phase out or just phase out. It's 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 kind of a it's kind of a bitter pill to swallow at times for a lot of people in the community because it's like they remember their mom or dad working in that plant until they got emphysema or asbestosis or, or some other related respiratory issue. So in many ways, they were happy to see the work, but also pained at the same time. Who's next? Yeah. Hello. Um, hello, I'm Cameron. Um, I'm talking to Major. Um, the one piece I was very intrigued about how you framed one of the characters in the, uh, the piece Unrest. One of the police officers faced away like he can't look at the, what's happening. Like it's a, he doesn't want to acknowledge that it's 
happening and it's part of one of his people that is getting being, you can't do anything about it because of his job. Good observation. Yeah, I mean, that piece was important because we don't want to put out the message that it's all law enforcement. It's not all law enforcement, but even if it's one person in the law community because we entrust all of our, our hopes and, and safety and everything else with our families. We don't want to put off that, that message that it's everyone as opposed that as it is a few, but it only takes a few to, to blow things out of control. But it also puts emphasis on the person that's facing away. They know that problem exists, but yet they still let it go on. All right, so that makes them very implicit. Complicit. complicit. They, they make them just as much as in, you know, the problem as the person that is, you know, doing those bad things. Uh, hello, my name is Gabriela. Um, my question was, going with the theme that you guys uh, could use, like, the things that you found to give kind of an essence to the piece, I was wondering if there's a piece that you feel you put a part of yourself more than the others? None of them. I mean, yeah. I mean, they all are important to us. Um, it's weird that you say that because we've actually sold a lot of our work, but they're still with us. Yeah, if that I makes mean, sense. We, we still see them in our studio, even though they're gone. They're they're gone. I don't think any one piece is more important than the next piece. I, I think the fact that we've had that whole factory mentality because we did get a, a, a chance to work in the factory that we produce and we produce a lot. Like in, in, in the case of our studio, we produce about four pieces at the same time. So we maximize our space and we maximize our time and our output. So once a piece leaves, then, you know, we've got so many pieces that are backlogged that we don't get a chance to be super attached to any one of them. Um, and I think that's important just to keep the, the pieces moving. Um, as far as putting a, like an, a, 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 an importance on one piece or another, I can't really say I, that. I can't really say that. Is one it's a favorite of another. And in fact, I mean, even with the factory pieces, I mean, that is, that is ongoing. That is just a lifetime commitment. I mean, I think that's something that Kelly and I, we made that choice decision. We can go and make cows in the past year and, you know, do nice, happy things, but that's not, we're not there yet. I think there's so much more for us to, to, to bring out. And, the, and just learn how to exhaust your possibilities so that you're not just going from basket weaving to watercolor, unless there's a common thread that connects those two very different medias. You, you have to learn how to exhaust your possibilities and, and keep your art moving. I think that's really important, especially for young artists, because you, you tend to think like, boom, 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 boom. I have all these great ideas, but then you end up not doing any one of those ideals very well because you're not with those ideals long enough. One thing that you guys have to explore if you guys have not explored is freeing yourself up from just doing your thing, all right? Do something that's uncomfortable. Do something that is, is, is not within your own comfort zone. Like if you're a painter, you know, why not jump into photography or, or printmaking, you know, find a way to merge those things together or better yet, have somebody collaborate and have them work on your work. See how comfortable that will be. So Kelly and I, we had this subconscious, okay, I'll start a project, he'll start a project. And then we just move full circle, kind of like an assembly line. I'll work on his, he'll work on mine and it becomes our work. There's not one single authorship yeah. that's happening in the gallery. It's our work. It's it's not Kelly's work. It's not my work. So you should try it out. How do you think your work changes as a result of that collaboration? I mean, it, what does that bring to the piece that wouldn't be there otherwise? Well, I, I think the work changes because it's not just about me and Kyle. It's about the community who where that work originated from. So we get a lot of active collaboration, even though that community members' hands never really touch the work, we are impacted by those interviews. We are impacted by those, those people who contribute, like um, whether it be somebody mailing us one of these guys, like the old school metal lunchbox with the thermos on the inside of it. 
I don't know how many pieces. In fact, there's a little bitty piece called Gearbox. It's the smallest piece in the gallery hanging up. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it over here. Yeah, so, so, so many times that we get so many, um, you know, pieces in the mail, whether it be an old work boot or, or, or a pair of uh, welding goggles or something from just a random person in the community that we've interviewed from. So I think that even though they don't actually physically touch any of the work, they do impact Kyle and I enough to actually, you know, inspire us to keep the, the work moving in that way. But also just between us, I think Kelly collaborating or if I'm collaborating or making something that it brings something new to the table, something that maybe you've not thought of, a different pose or, you know, a different color or, you know, this should be a certain way that in your mind, you already have it set. It should look like this. Well, if you back away from it and have somebody come in, you know, and change it up, you know, that just opens up a whole different perspective that maybe you've not even taken consideration. Yet. So I think it's worth it. Spoken like true educators. Um, so we're probably gonna wrap up here in just a few minutes, but do we have any other questions that you'd like to ask? This is a, this is a really rare opportunity um, to be able to ask them questions directly. It can be on any level. One more. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hey guys. <laughs> Jazz here, it's good to see you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you guys on, on this show um, and in the past as well. Um, I'm just kind of seeing relationships between your work and Magda Parasitis' work in the Miller Gallery. Um, I don't know if you have a chance to see her pieces there. Uh, okay. So I'm wondering if there's something you can say about um, the structures that you build or, or, or buildings, you know, like the, the flat, say in the steel worker piece, you know, the tall factory piece with smokestacks, right? Yeah. And she talked about her work in the same fashion that she would photograph these power plants and these buildings of confinement, like prisons or the ghetto of New York City. Um, is there maybe a symbol that you would attach to the backdrop being kind of this confined um, yeah. apparatus? Like it's like this controlling, I don't know, uh, thing of oppression, I don't know. Yeah, so so like um, all of the factory settings that you see, the figures exist in a really small space, a cell, a, what they call a cell in the factory. So it surprised Kyle and I when we first got introduced to to the factory by force, I guess, because our, our father got us a job in the plant and we were like, we don't want any part of this. <laughs> um, it was uh, dirty, dark loud loud the fact that we had a college degree and we were thrown in the mix with um with people in the plant um and the fact that it was just so crazy loud i mean machines droning so loud you can even hum a song in your head because you know the, the rhythmic machine the sounds of the machines going on the fact that our father worked in a cell that was like a nine by ten cell for over 20 years in the middle of a plant that it had no windows. So the only windows were the clear stereo windows above his head, which you couldn't look out anyway. And that's what's referenced in the back, those little triangle, little niches. That's what you typically would see in factories that you'll see over and over again. And those are those were purpose, those were purpose built. It's so that productivity remained high, so you didn't have daydreamers looking out the windows. So the windows were always above the workers' eyes so that you could only focus on what you were supposed to focus on. So it was like, I, I totally understand that whole notion of that controlled tight space and how that really affects a person in the long run. Because like I said, my father worked in, in, in a metal plant with no windows. And Kyle and I, the first day of walking into that plant and seeing, wow, this is where we're gonna be. It is very demoralizing. It could be very, mentally channel and challenging to have to do something repetitive for decades for for every i mean i hold up a sponge like like these are flat gears so 
if you're in charge of the flat gear cell, this is what you make forever. I mean, 20 <laughs> years uh, of this. So not only does this have a profound effect on you psychologically, but physiologically, I mean, your hands, you start to lose control of your hands take on weird shapes. Like we look at our dad's hands and yeah, he big had knuckles, big knuckles. And, and, you know, those weren't exaggerations. That's repetitive. You are part of the machine. So that became something that we noticed right away. It's been so nice of you to, to be here and to talk to the students. I mean, not only are you a uh, practicing artists that make incredible work that is um, so relevant, but also the skill at skill level is just phenomenal. Um, kind of mind blowing actually. Um, but also the fact that you're educators really comes out when you speak, not only when you're encouraging the students, but just the way in which you are so clear in your communication, you're, you're in the work and it's amazing. So thank you guys so much.